How to make probiotic milk kefir masterclass. Everything you need to know to be a successful kefir maker using milk kefir grains. Since we're going to cover a lot of territory, I've divided this masterclass into segments. This way you can return to the video if needed and jump to the section you want to revisit. Depending on where you live in the world, how you pronounce it will vary, such as kefir, kefir, and kefir. Point being, we're all talking about the same thing and pronunciation is not a priority. If you're starting from absolute zero, then you'll need to source for yourself some milk kefir grains. This video picks up at the point where you've already purchased the grains, have activated them, and now you're ready to make the kefir. But if you haven't gotten your kefir grains yet, watch my prequel video to this one where I share with you where to buy the milk kefir grains, what forms they come in, for example, dehydrated or fresh, and how to activate them after you receive them in the mail. Then pick up right back here to continue on how to make milk kefir indefinitely. Plus, learn what it means when this happens to your kefir and so much more. Section one, introduction to the kefir grain. These gelatinous asymmetrical pods are not actually a grain like wheat, rice, or barley. Kefir grains have no plant affiliation and are 100% gluten-free. So don't let the kefir grain term deter you. So what are they? Kefir grains are little colonies of beneficial yeasts and bacteria. These beneficial microbes are often generically called probiotics. Depending on the health of the grains and their origins, hands down, milk kefir is one of the most natural probiotic dense foods that exists on the planet. And just an FYI, I've got an upcoming video that will provide in-depth information on the difference between homemade kefir versus store-bought. The difference will shock you and you'll be right back here to make your own true kefir at home using the grains. You may have heard of water kefir and it's important to know that although water kefir grains also contain health promoting yeasts and bacteria, milk kefir grains and water kefir grains differ in this very important way. Both feed on natural sugars, but milk kefir grains specifically require a natural milk sugar called lactose in order to survive. Without lactose to feed on, they will die, whereas water kefir grains do not require lactose. On the flip side, water kefir grains cannot metabolize lactose. Even though both grains have some similarities, they have significant differences in structure, microbial content, and impact of the finished beverage product. There are pros and cons to each, but that's another video. For this video, we will be fermenting with milk kefir grains using dairy milk, but I will be coming out with a plant-based milk kefir video. I often get asked how many probiotics are in kefir. Well, that's not a straightforward answer. The bacteria and yeast species present in milk kefir grains are variable depending on where the grains are from. Additionally, factors such as the health of the grains, which type of milk they were cultivated in, environmental temperature, and duration of the fermentation all play a role in quantifying the amount of probiotics present in milk kefir. So it's not a standardized number. But to give you some kind of an idea, here's a generalization based on a compilation of studies and articles. We're looking at approximately 500 billion probiotics per cup or 250 milliliters. Considering store-bought probiotic capsules range from only around 10 billion to 30 billion, maybe even as high as 50 to 100 billion in some of the more expensive formulas, a kefir fermented from the grains knocks them all out of the park. Here is a simple overview of how the beneficial microbes of the kefir grains ferment the milk. The microbial species present in kefir grains that are responsible for fermenting the milk into kefir are a combination of bacteria and yeasts. The bacteria consume the natural sugar in the milk, the lactose, break it down, and release lactic acid as their byproduct. The lactic acid is what's responsible for the tangy sourness of the kefir. The yeast species, also present in kefir grains, process the natural sugar in the milk, the lactose, and release carbon dioxide and alcohol as byproducts. The carbon dioxide they produce is what's responsible for the effervescence of the kefir. 
If you have concerns about the alcohol produced by the yeast, allow me to relieve your worries. The alcohol production is nominal, and there's also a bacteria in the kefir called Acetobacter that feed on the yeast alcohol byproduct and break that down as well. Another way to look at it is, you're getting more alcohol from a bite of ripe banana than from a properly fermented kefir. I want to add a side note here on lactose intolerance in kefir. Lactose intolerance occurs when the small intestine doesn't produce enough of an enzyme called lactase, which breaks down the milk sugar lactose. When the body is unable to break down lactose, that's when the symptoms of lactose intolerance arise. But little it may be known is that the beneficial microbes of milk kefir grains actually break down the lactose in the milk during the fermentation process, essentially pre-digesting it so that the human body doesn't have to. That's why many lactose intolerant people can drink a true milk kefir without symptoms. Even more good news is the same can be applied to the milk protein called casein. The good acid producing bacteria of the kefir grains not only break down the lactose, but break down the casein protein during the fermentation as well, essentially pre-digesting it and making the kefir fermented milk easy on the human body. Now that we have the basics of kefir covered, let's move on to the next topic. Section two, types of milk. As mentioned in the previous section, milk kefir grains require lactose for survival. Therefore, they're going to thrive in almost any milk that naturally contains lactose, which is going to be mammal milk. Do not use any milk that is labeled lactose-free since the milk kefir grains require the lactose for survival. That's why I'm making a separate video for plant-based milk kefirs because a tweak must be made due to the absence of lactose in those kinds of milks. Feel free to use any of these milks for your kefir making. Cow's milk, including whole, one or 2%, non-fat, raw, pasteurized, homogenized, non-homogenized, which means cream on top, and even powdered milk. Goat, sheep, and buffalo milk is also okay to use since they're all mammals and contain lactose. The exception to lactose containing milk is ultra pasteurized milk, also known as UHT milk. Regular pasteurized milk is fine because it's heated at a lower temperature compared to the ultra pasteurized milk. The difference in this pasteurization temperature is the game changer because the heat levels used for ultra pasteurized milk degrade the lactose molecular structure. Kefir grains have a hard time feeding on degraded lactose. If you're already making kefir with ultra pasteurized milk and your grains are having trouble, switch milks. Remember, even regular pasteurized milk is fine. It's the ultra pasteurized version that is red flagged for making true kefir. With the foundational basics of kefir covered, let's get on with making it. Section three, day one instructions. Typically, when you're just starting out with newly activated grains, begin with a tablespoon or around 20 grams. Place the grains in the glass jar, then add about four cups or 950 milliliters of milk. Leave about two inches or five centimeters of headspace to allow room for the kefir grains to expand during fermentation. Place a regular lid on the jar and allow it to sit on the counter for 12 to 30 hours. So which one is it? 12 or 30 hours. I'm going to further discuss fermentation duration in an upcoming section, so stay with me and watch the whole video through. As for this jar, I'll let it sit overnight and tomorrow we'll see how the kefir grains fermented the milk into kefir, followed by instructions on what to do next. But first I'm going to share with you how to optionally amp up the effervescence of the kefir. You don't have to amp up the effervescence of the kefir, but if you do want to, now is the time to make the adjustment with the lid. How loose or tight the jar lid is on the jar, this will be your control on the effervescence level the kefir will become. If you want less effervescence, then place the lid on loosely, just set it on top like so. This allows for the carbon dioxide gases that the yeast produce to escape, hence reducing effervescence. If you do want to intensify those little zingy carbon dioxide bubbles on your tongue, similar to champagne bubbles, then secure the lid on tightly. This will prevent the carbon dioxide from escaping, hence intensifying the effervescence. Don't worry, the jar will not explode with the lid being on tightly for just a day. Section four, signs of fermentation. It's the next day and I see the kefir has successfully fermented. Let's take a closer look at the signs of fermentation. See this top portion? You'll notice that it looks different than the portion below. 
This is where the milk has turned into curds. Here's what it looks like from the top view. This is 100% normal looking. Why is it doing that? Remember the bacteria that make up the kefir grains that are acid producers? When the acid becomes significant enough in the milk, the response of the milk is curdling. That's what you're looking at in this section, curdled milk. When the kefir first begins, it will taste like plain milk. As the fermentation progresses, not only does the curdling increase, but so does the sour flavor. What happened here? This is separation of the whey from the milk solids. It doesn't look great, but the kefir's okay. It's not spoiled, so don't throw it out. Let's explore this more so you know what this means for your kefir. The microbes feed on the natural milk sugar, the lactose. When they begin to run out of food, that's when the first signs of whey separation occur. You can see tiny breaks or pockets beginning to form here in the milk. These are little whey breaks and indicate it's time to end the fermentation since it has successfully commenced. You're going to get the highest probiotic count and the most balanced flavor at this peak window when there are only very small separations. If the fermentation is not ended at this point, the whey will further separate more and more since the fermentation process will continue to progress. Many people believe that there are more probiotics present the longer the kefir ferments, but specifically regarding kefir, that's actually not true. The greater the whey separation means the hungrier or more starving the probiotics are. This is called over-fermentation. When the kefir significantly over-ferments, the sour tangy flavor and the effervescence intensifies. Many kefir makers purposely over-ferment in order to make a really thick kefir, which I'll show you how to do in my next video, or for other reasons such as flavor preference. I just want to be clear, do what you wanna do. There's no condemnation if you prefer your kefir over-fermented. Here's another tip. Once the milk and the whey separate, they'll never come back together as one unless you shake it. Even then, it will be temporary before it separates again. The kefir will remain combined longer if you stop the fermentation before separation occurs. Section five, day two, pouring off the kefir, separating the grains from the curds, and storage instructions. Before I jump into these instructions, please allow me to take a moment to say thank you for watching my videos. I put a tremendous amount of time and effort into them so that you can benefit from the most comprehensive learning possible. If you appreciate what I do, I'd be so grateful if you bought me a cup of tea. Your $5 donation helps me keep doing what I do. With that said, let's move on. Now that the fermentation signs are understood, it's concluded that this kefir is ready to be poured off. Most of the kefir grains float up to the milk surface and are intermingled with the curds. There may be some grains hanging out at the bottom of the jar as well. Either is fine. We need to filter out the grains from the milk kefir. Therefore, with a fine mesh strainer, pour out the contents of the jar. The thinner kefir will flow right through and the strainer will catch the curds in the kefir grains. With a spatula or clean washed hands, gently push around the mixture. This is going to work the curds through the strainer until only the kefir grains remain. This process takes about a minute or two. The strainer can be metal or nylon. I know that many say not to allow metal to come in contact with the grains, but for the matter of seconds that the grains may touch the metal, in all my experience, I've never witnessed hindered kefir grains as a result. Don't ferment the kefir grains in metal because that would be a really prolonged exposure. But as far as filtering with a metal strainer, it's fine. You can reuse the jar the kefir was just made in or use a fresh jar. I typically reuse the jar three or four times, but for this demonstration, I'll use a new one. Place the grains in the jar as is. Do not rinse the grains under water. I explain in greater detail as why not to do this in the upcoming troubleshooting section of this video. Then add the milk. Place either a loose or tight lid on the jar, depending on if you want enhanced effervescence or not. Allow it to sit on the counter overnight. It's an exact repeat from day one. As for the kefir, give it a taste test. Take note of its consistency and flavor, zingy bubbles on the tongue, on an intense level or on a mild level. Based on all the info from this video, including what I'll be sharing with you in the upcoming sections, you can make adjustments. 
To store, place a tight lid on the jar and keep it in the refrigerator where it will last up to two or three weeks. The cool temps of the fridge will drastically slow the continuing fermentation down, but will not stop it completely. Therefore, you may notice that the flavor will continue to evolve. A thickening may or may not happen. Effervescence may increase. It may separate. All of those occurrences are normal. But don't go anywhere. We're not done yet. I still need to share with you how to adjust the rate of fermentation if needed and troubleshooting tips. Segment six, how to adjust the rate of fermentation. The milk kefir fermentation period typically varies from 12 to 30 hours, depending on two main factors. One, environmental temperature. The warmer the environment, the faster the kefir will ferment. The cooler the environment, the slower it will ferment. Two, the kefir grain to milk ratio. The standard ratio is about one tablespoon, 20 grams of kefir grains to four cups, 950 milliliters of milk. This of course is a suggestion and not the law. So the grain and milk ratios can be varied. If you use less milk than the standard ratio, the kefir grains will take less time to ferment simply because there's less milk present. On the flip side, if you use more milk than the standard ratio, it will take longer for the microbes to ferment it because there's just more milk present. The lactose content also plays a role in the fermentation speed. Milks with a lower lactose content will ferment slower than milks that contain a higher content and vice versa. For example, goat milk will make successful kefir, but it will ferment at a slower rate than cow's milk. Now let's add the element of temperature. Let's consider this example using the standard ratio of grains to milk. The kefir can perhaps take only eight hours to ferment in the summer while taking 24 to 30 hours in the winter. Not because the grains to milk ratio changed, but the temperature did. If you find your kefir fermenting too quickly and you want to slow it down, do this. Either move the kefir to a cooler environment, add more milk to the grains, or both. If you find your kefir fermenting too slow and you want to speed it up, do this. Either move the kefir to a warmer environment, add less milk to the grains, or both. You may even find that you don't need to change anything at all. But in any case, it's on you to keep an eye on the kefir and make the necessary adjustments to create the optimum fermentation speed based on what works best for your schedule and your kefir needs. As for your first batch or two or even three, follow these video instructions so that you get the hang of it. Then you'll feel more comfortable making adjustments later if needed. Section seven, troubleshooting. Healthy kefir grains are whitish to a light yellowish cream color. If your grains become discolored, such as pink, black, gray, blue, etc., this is a sign that the grains have become contaminated and should be discarded. You'll have to start over with new grains. If you smell the kefir, it may smell neutral or it may smell slightly yeasty from the yeast or slightly acidic from the bacteria. All of these mild scents are normal. If one of those scents is overpowering, then that indicates there is a microbial imbalance of either yeast or bacteria, but it does not mean that the grains are bad, so don't throw them out. However, if the grains develop a rotting or offensive stench, different from yeasty or acidic, that means either the kefir grains have died and are spoiling, or they've become contaminated with bad microbes. In either case, discard the grains and start again with a new batch. If your grains become sticky, it's okay. Here's what's happening. The good microbes of the kefir grains produce a polysaccharide matrix called kefirin, which is considered a biofilm. In other words, the microbes are producing a protective layer around themselves to keep bad microbes out. It's a self-defense mechanism. This is why we do not want to rinse the grains. Rinsing removes that protective barrier. It won't kill the grains if you rinse them. Lots of kefir makers out there do rinse. I don't think they fully understand the kefirin element, but rinsing is a setback for the grains, so my advice is not to. In addition to being a protective coating, Kefirin also has many uses due to its therapeutic values. Kefirin has a prebiotic nature, agitating the growth of the probiotics in the gastrointestinal tract. And it extends certain therapeutic benefits by balancing the microbiota in the intestine. If your grains seem extra, extra sticky, that just means there's extra, extra kefirin and you're still okay. Don't throw it out. 
Lastly, your grains will grow and multiply as they continue to be fed milk and are happy and healthy. Within one to two weeks, your grains will most likely have doubled. Soon you can have too many grains for your kefir making needs. Here are some suggestions on what to do with extra kefir grains. Pass along the gift of homemade kefir by splitting them off and giving them away. Freeze or dry the grains for long-term storage. Eat the grains by blending them into a smoothie or mixing them into oatmeal or yogurt. They don't have much taste and they have kind of like jelly-like texture. You'll be eating the exact good microbes that are responsible for making the kefir, so it's all good. I've heard some moms say that their kids love them, but if you or the kids don't want to eat them, feed them to your pets. I'm going to wrap this kefir masterclass up here, but truly, I've got more good stuff coming on the kefir topic, such as how to make really thick kefir and how to dry or freeze the kefir grains if you need to take a kefir break. When these videos are published, you'll find the links for all of them in the description. Check out my website, cleanfoodliving.net, and I'll see you next time. Bye for now.